Hey Guru Nation, welcome back to the clinicaltrialsguru.com. Also, this is on the podcast, Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. We're on episode 100 and something. Okay, I don't know exactly what episode we're on. If I had to guess, so I would say 104, 105, somewhere around that. Today, we are interviewing, I am interviewing, Raymond Nomizu from clinicalresearch.io. One of the best domain names I've heard in a while. Uh, when did you get that domain? Uh, it was in 2015. We couldn't find anything with .com. Couldn't find anything with .org, so we went with .io. That's recent. That's surprising. Okay, so clinicalresearch.io. And the .io domain has really taken off. A lot of vendors in this industry are yes. using that. Yes, um, it's definitely something a lot of startups have latched onto, and um, I don't know exactly what it stands for, but I always tell people it's input output. Ah, very good. So you do now you do eSource, you sell eSource to sites, mm -hmm. but what this interview is going to be focusing on is that, of course, we're going to get into eSource and how that's going to play a role in the future of clinical research. But you used to own a site, right, or several sites? Can you give us some background? Right. Yes, I. I, I still own a site. Um, I still have an ownership interest, but I'm not actively involved in the management of it. But I used to own and operate a clinical research site, a standalone site, phase two, three, internal medicine, dermatology. Um, I actually acquired it in 2012. I was looking for a business to purchase. And I bought it with the hypothesis that there would be site um, consolidation, that there would be a network of sites um, that would be appealing. And so my goal is to if that worked out well, I would try to open up another one and have another one, et cetera. Um, but I'm not actively involved anymore. I'm, I'm doing my uh, technology startup full time now. I see. I, Are you a doctor? Are you an MD? Were you the PA? No, I, I'm not. I um, have a background as a management consultant, so I'm a lawyer by training. So I have a JD. Uh, I only practiced for a very short time. And then I went into the business side of things. So I was a consultant for um, at least 10 years. And I did a lot of uh, strategy, process management, et cetera. And I wanted to run my own business. I wanted to put my money where my mouth is and actually, you know, implement what I've been telling people um, to do. So I was looking for a business to buy, and I happened to buy, you know, find a clinical research site for sale in 2012. 2012. And do you still own it now? Yeah, I, I still have an ownership interest, but I'm, I'm not actively involved uh, as an officer. Okay. But you've learned prior to that, you weren't doing anything in this space, right? Or no I, I i literally learned it from ground up um but as when i was managing it i i did the budgets i did business development and then i actually rolled up my sleeves and i became a coordinator so i did my own visits i <laughs> Good. Um, did QC entry i did qc i cleaned up a lot of messes yeah i know another jd actually who is very similar owned bought and owned a site here in southern california and still doing it he's doing everything he's wearing all the hats Yep. Um, so, and he's, he's dabbling a little bit in being a monitor. Uh, yep. so yeah, lots of, op lots of opportunities here that people don't realize. So what were you doing before clinical research and how did you get introduced to this field? So I was at that point independent, self-employed. I had always wanted to run my own business. So I became a consultant I became an independent consultant for a while there. Um, and I started a, uh, low grade search looking for a business. To buy. This was back just a couple of years after the big recession. So I knew that that would be a good time to buy a business. Any business that was still in business at that time was probably a good business. Yeah. Um, so I found this business for sale. It was online. The owner had posted it on a website. It's called, I think, bizbuysell.com. Really? Uh, but there's a bunch of them. And you just go online and you look for a service business um, and you put in some basic parameters and it just happened to meet my criteria. Um, I did some due diligence on it, had pretty good cash flow, had diversified customers. I spent a lot of time looking at the question of, is research going to be outsourced? Because it's a lot cheaper in other countries. Um, but I came across a lot of evidence that says, you know, the FDA really wants to see trials done in the United States. So I figured, okay, well, there's a reason why it's going to remain a brick, brick and mortar business in the United States. So I wasn't too concerned about that. That was my probably my biggest worry when I, when I bought this. So once I got comfortable with that risk, I went ahead and acquired it. Interesting. Very good. And so once you acquired it, you became very hands-on. Mm -hmm. And that's where you learned pain points. Yes. And it, you saw all the inefficiencies, right? Compared yes. to other industries, why is this industry 
so far behind when it comes to pretty much everything, like adoptions of new technologies, yeah. uh, best practices from other. I mean, we're yeah. we're barely seeing like when it comes to patient recruitment ads. You know, people are just now learning about Google AdWords, and right. uh, this is like 2005 type of stuff. Yeah, it's uh, and I think being an outsider and, and having worked with other industries before and consulting, I, I think it gave me a sort of a, like a set of patterns and practices that I recognize. So when I took over this industry, I was like, this is really, really archaic. I, I think it's a highly regulated industry, so I think there's a lot of conservatism built in. I think it's also an industry, it's a little curious because, um, you know, all the economics and, and the direction of the industry, a lot of that is controlled by major pharmaceutical companies. Um, and a lot of the research sites are, are fragmented, right? Outside of the major academic centers and some a handful of very large sites and site networks that have become big, most sites are, for the most part, small practices, and there's many of them. So a lot of them don't have the resources to invest in technology, to create and seed their own technology, uh, and really rely on the sponsors of pharmaceutical companies yeah. to guide them how to do the business. But to be honest with you, pharma companies are good at molecules. That's what they do, right? They're, they're scientists. Yeah. But they are not necessarily in the business of technology, of research workflows. That's not really what they do. They rely on the sites to recruit patients. So there really hasn't emerged a, a player that's really been large enough that had the resources and the capability set to really modernize the way research is done at the research site level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're relying on pharma to help show you uh, best practices or latest innovations in technology, you're relying on the wrong group because that's Absolutely. they're not going to do anything for you. Exactly. And that's arguably it's not their obligation to do that. Right. right. I mean, they're picking sites that already claim that they have the best practices, that already claim they have the recruiting capabilities. So they're relying on the sites to do this. I mean, they're not in the business of telling sites how to run their business. I feel like I the pharma already do more than they should. I mean, there's a, I'm working with a couple sites right now through my digital marketing company, and mm -hmm. these there's pharma companies paying to build landing pages for the sites and mm -hmm. then using their money for Google and Facebook ads. Like, they're doing plenty for you. You know, I think the sites, sites kind of get used to that. Right. And they, they just become passive and say, well, pharma's not going to do it for me. I'm not right. going to do it. Absolutely. And, and and we encounter that all the time. A lot of sites will say, well, I'm not going to take control of my destiny. I'm not going to invest in technology. I'm not going to do research. I'm just going <laughs> to wait for the pharma companies to come along and tell me what to do yeah. and to solve it for me. And I keep saying, well, you're waiting for a long time because yeah. they're not going to solve it for you. They don't know your workflow. They don't know your And by the time problems. they do that for you, it's no longer going to be a competitive advantage because everyone's going to have it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So let's get into clinicalresearch.io. So when did you start this? Well, first of all, what? Did, why did you start it? So you 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 took over the clinic. You mm -hmm. started doing everything in it. What were some of the first things you noticed? Well, to be honest with you, I had a lot of challenges with quality, um, and I started taking a lot of corrective measures to try to improve quality, make it consistent. So the first thing I started doing was I started writing the, my source template. So I took that away from the staff, I wrote it myself. I still had quality problems because I could write the way I want to, but it doesn't mean that it's actually gonna be executed the way I wrote it. Um, and I really tried to implement best practices like you know, finish all the source template at the time of the visit. Do not leave it blank, have everything done. That way you don't have to constantly you know, keep track of it. Um, but I had no way of keeping track of it. I had no way of enforcing it. I, 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 so I said to myself, I wish I could be a fly on the wall during the visit itself and just make sure that people have, you know, do everything correctly. Um, and then I was at a, a health screening fair and um, I just you know, signed up for an alarm and someone took my vitals and they had a, a, an iPad or some kind of a tablet in front of the internet. And it's like, well, you know, why don't we do that? So that was in 2015. And then I thought to myself, you know, if we had a, a, a business or we had a, a great technology that sites could use that allowed coordinators to fill in the data electronically, we could get rid of a lot of the quality problems. And we could allow managers and other people at the site who rely on this data to log in and see the data in real time without having to go track down a binder. And we can create accountability and create transparency. So um, I approached my current business partner. Um, he's a, a technology guru. I mean, he's really good at this stuff. And we had done some work before. Um, he had built a, a software application for me in a different venture. So I, I know good technologists when I see one. 
Um, I, I showed him some of the source templates. I said, how hard is it to build a technology that does this? And he looked at it and said, very easy. It's not hard. Not hard technically to build something that allows you to capture questions and answers. So with that, we launched this business in 2015. Um, we raised some funding in 2016. We actually deployed it. Um, I think what we did well, I think the hard part for doing this is building it in a way that's user friendly, that's workable for research sites. And I think that's the hard part um, that we solved. It's not so much, you know, can you build an application that lets you put data in? Yes, there's there's tons of them, right? They're not very good. They're not very user friendly. They certainly don't work for research sites. So what we've done is, is we've taken the technology is already there, and we built a web-based um, software system that we can now offer to research sites on a fairly affordable basis um, because it's all web-based. Um, and now they can benefit from the technology investment that we've made uh, into this you know, great piece of software. Interesting. Okay, so you started that in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, launched it in 2016, and... I'm assuming you used your sites as the guinea pig? Yes. My site was the first site to go live. <laughs> now, how did you get the sponsor to approve that? So that's where the regulatory guidelines come in. We did a lot of research ahead of time on this issue, and I was actually a little bit nervous about this. But it, it turns out that the regulatory guidelines are pretty clear. The, the principal investigator's responsibility is to maintain source documents. And the... 21 CFR Part 11 guidelines, which is the FDA published guidelines on the use of electronic systems, basically says that electronic source uh, data is equivalent legally of handwritten data in terms of legal equivalence, as long as the software system is Part 11 compliant. So we consulted with some outside cons regulatory experts and we consulted with a number of them and all of them came back and said, yeah, as long as the principal investigator can show that this document or this software system is part 11 compliant and that they're using it in a part 11 compliant manner. In other words, they're not sharing passwords, et cetera, there's a basic SOP in place. Then they can use electronic source to capture source data. It's, it's totally within the discretion of the PI. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in a lot of oncology trials, it's actually how it's being captured. It's actually being captured in the EHR because in oncology trials, the, um, you know, the, the, the research medication is the, is the drug, right? It is the standard of care. So it's, it's just part and parcel of the, of the patient's treatment. So electronic medical records are already being utilized. It's being utilized with, you know, EPRO, e ECOA. All this is, is just another extension of that. Um, and so once we got the regulatory opinion, we got comfortable with that, and we, we built our compliance documentation, um, we took the position um, that PIs have the right to use e-source. The sponsors have the right to validate that that e-source is compliant with GCP and, and PAR 11 guidelines. And so that's the position that, that we take. And we've had almost no pushback from sponsors since we launched. What, what do you have to do to be Part 11 compliant? There is a set of requirements that are published, so you need to follow those requirements. But the main thing, the most important thing that is really the core of it is the audit trail. You need to have this concept that every piece of data that's entered or modified, there has to be attribution to it. And the attribution is basically the user as well as the date time. And if there's a modification, the reason for the modifications. So that's why in a lot of EC systems, when you make a change, it'll ask you what was the reason for change. And it'll, you'll see the, the audit trail there. Mm -hmm. That audit trail cannot be alterable. It cannot be modifiable by anybody, right? It's, it's baked into the system and there's nothing you can do about it. So that's how you become part 11 compliant on the, the, the data part of it. And then the other part of it is the signatures. If the electronic signature meets certain requirements, it basically has two forms of authentication, so username and password is, is one way of doing it, then that's the equivalent of a handwritten signature. Um, so if you document all of that, if you, you build the software the right way, and you have all the features and you can show that, and the site in turn utilizes the appropriate way, right? So you can't take a Part 11 software system and then subvert it by you know posting the PI's password by taking a few examples. So you, you need to have some kind of an SOP that says, People are properly trained. People understand that their login credentials are unique. They don't share them. Um, they're accountable for them. And as long as you have some basic SOP in place to meet your requirements as a user, then you can demonstrate Part 11 compliance. I see. So I could imagine, I mean, you're very early in this, right? Yeah. Um, we're, we don't use eSort. Most of the sites I know, I would say 99% uh, yep. use paper source right. maybe even more than 99 percent. so but that's good for you a lot of opportunity right i think you're early 
um, you're going to get a lot of challenges, right, from sides. They're mm -hmm. going to say, well, you know, the one we talked about earlier, we're going to wait for pharma to uh, right. reimburse us for this. And then pharma is going to tell them, well, why don't you just use paper for this trial, right? Uh, because they don't understand it. J the same right. reason why you were fearful is, you know, other sites are going to be even more fearful because it's not their product. So mm -hmm. what are what are some of the uh, objection handling, um, I guess, statements that you tell them when, when they give you these kind of pushback? Yeah, yeah. The, the main thing that I stress is that if the eSource system is appropriately designed, it should save a tremendous amount of time. Sites spend a lot of time printing out paper, managing binders, fixing you know tabs, um, uh, spend a lot of time filling in subject headers, filling in a lot of time doing signatures and dates, hmm. doing conversions and calculations and formulas, um, writing progress notes, checking, double checking, triple checking, putting post-it notes, moving binders around. People don't understand how much time is actually spent on those kinds of activities. And we estimate about 20% of coordinators' time is spent on doing things that could be eliminated if there was a good e-source system that was capturing everything, automating everything on the front end. Sure, sure. Um, that's across not just the visit itself, but across all the things after the visit, particularly all the cleanup work that goes around, that happens when you make mistakes that could have been avoided. Um, so it's definitely about time savings and productivity. It's also about quality of data. Um, you know, mistakes should go down tremendously, right? And that contributes to part of the reason why the, the time commitment goes down. Um, it's about differentiating your site to employees, making being a more attractive place to work, being able to attract um, new employees who view this as sort of a cutting edge way of doing things. And also with sponsors, we're finding that a lot of our sites are showing at the site selection visit, the monitor, what the technology looks like and how easy it is for the monitors to, to monitor because it's easy for the CRAs as well. They can log into one place, they can work after hours. If they don't finish up their monitoring visit by 5 p.m., they go back to the hotel, log in for another 45 minutes and finish up. Very clear, very clean. There's always an audit trail. There's no question about people not filling things in. So the CRAs like it too, and a lot of our sites are using this almost like a business development advantage during the site selection visit. Can, can the CRA query the eSource? Yes. Ah, yes. Very good. Yep. yep. They can log in. It's, it's read-only access. So they can't make any modifications. They see only the study subjects. And that's been the problem with the HR systems. Most electronic medical record systems have a really hard time allowing a site to restrict access just to the study subjects. And by the way, not just to the study subjects, but when you see the study subjects, you see everything, including all their patient history that predates the, uh, the um, research itself. So you obviously have a big hip of concern. And so a lot of sites that use EMR as their resource system end up having to print out the, the electronic chart, stamp a certified copy, put in a binder, well, now it's become hard copy. Or, and if the monitor wants to actually confirm that the copy on paper is actually electronic, well, they log in and someone's standing over the shoulder to make sure they don't leave the page, and, and nobody really likes that experience. So part of our challenge has been that CRAs and sponsors, when they hear eSource, the first thing that comes to mind is EHR, and how is the CRA going to get it, and is it going to be this big pain in the neck? Um, and so we always advise our sites, you know, just send a notification out of your intent to use it. When the monitor shows up, then train the monitor, show the monitor how easy it is to use. And most CRAs will embrace the technology because it makes their job easier. It makes the data quality better. Um, so those are, that's really the value proposition we're selling. We're saying don't wait for the sponsors to control your data. You are accountable. If you make a mistake and there's a deviation, that's on the PI. That's on you. That's not on the sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, and they're looking for you. Um, to be a leader in data quality and recruiting, and that's why they, they picked you, right? And that's what you represented in the feasibility questionnaires, is you have that capability. Interesting. Okay, so I understand the e-source. Now, how this integrates with EHR, so uh, for the medical records? No, it, right now it does not, um, but we have always told our clients that it's not hard to build an integration, so if there are clients that want to have some kind of integration feed. We've, we've talked to them about how that could happen and that will work. Okay. Obviously it takes two vendors, right? So it wouldn't be just be us, it'd be conversation right. with the HR. Right. So well. for now, the way the sites are using it, uh, they're using the source, the e-source, yep. and then they're just printing out certified copies of the uh, medical records. Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. So they, they're not printing out our e-source, 
Right. But um, if it's a physician practice and they have the MR, they do print it out, stamp it certified, and then treat it almost like a third party um, documentation, which is what they're doing now for the most part anyway. Um, but sure. now they've got a tool that they can use for the, for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to upload the EMR, let's say, to this platform? Yes. So we built our system to have what we call lab routing functionality. We say lab routing, but it can be anything that's a hard copy paper. So think labs, EKG tracings, mm. uh, medical records, any oh, type of Oh, that's right. Paper. Yeah, I didn't even think of those. Yeah. Exactly. So any type of piece of paper that you can get into a PDF, which you can scan as a PDF, or maybe you get emailed to you as a PDF, you can, with our system, upload it to the study. You can tag it to the particular subject and to the visit, and then you can describe it with some text. And then you can actually route it to the PI for signature. So now the PIs can actually see um, the lab itself. And there's a little markup tool. It's like a PDF markup tool, like a, there's a little pencil markup. There's mm -hmm. some text markup. And they can affix all their annotations directly on there, hit e sign, and now it's posted. So yeah, that lab never has to get printed out. And when you do it electronically, now you've got one place where you can see all the labs and you be signed. You can keep track of whether the doctor has signed or not signed it. Um, and our system, when the doctor e-signs it, the coordinator will get an email back confirming signatures. Now the coordinator just hit a button, go right to the place, just you know, double check, make sure that there aren't any follow-up items, et cetera. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I can see the value prop. And um, for the most part, if you explain to the sponsor that this is what you'll be using, they're not going to have objections, I don't think. Right. Uh, I mean, I would say 50-50, maybe. I don't know. It's yeah, that, I, That's going to get better over time. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the, the major sponsors, CROs, are not going to have an issue. A lot of them have um, questionnaires that they'll ask you to fill out, like basically validation tools. A lot of the smaller ones won't, and they'll uh, you know, accept usage of it. Every once in a while, we'll encounter a sponsor, typically a smaller one, that isn't familiar with the guidelines and so there's an education process about you know that this is the PI's right to do that it's no different than using the HR which is something that you know the FDA is encouraged mm -hmm. as a source so um, we've been able to overcome all, all objections um, I think this would be a huge value prop for a CRO trying to win a bid um, yes you know they can validate to the sponsors right. hey we make sure that Alcoa is being followed. I mean, right. we have an audit trail. You can't do that with right. paper. Right, exactly. And they can monitor in real time. They can be central monitoring. That's the trend that mm -hmm. is the, the industry is going. A lot of sponsors are spending 20, 25% of the budget on monitoring. Um, and right. the data is validated every six to eight weeks or so when the monitors come. Even remote monitoring doesn't really help because somebody still has to scan it from the site, send it in, somebody yeah. has to two pieces of documents, right? So this eliminates all of that. And for a CRO, and they can basically add value as a CRO and said, hey, you know, we can be, it's a more efficient way of doing things. It's better, it's cleaner, faster for you. Um, and now the CRO can focus on more important things like managing sites, dealing with recruitment. Instead of Training. having fairly, yeah. fairly well-paid and well-skilled people, you know, double-checking signatures and making sure that, you know, five over here matches five. Over here. That's not a good use of people's time. So really it's about focusing on what's good. And, and that same argument applies for sites too. Now they can spend more time focusing on um, patient recruiting, patient compliance, things that really actually move the needle for performance and not, hey, I I put the subject header in wrong. I got to go and cross it out. Oh, I forgot to date that change. You know, it just goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. As far as the headers, are, are they done automatically? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we automate subject headers, BMI, averages, um, anything that you want to automate, you can pretty much automate. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you want some room for people that, to enter things, but you can also build in alerts too. So what I always say is if the BMI cutoff is 40, in real time, when you enter the height and weight, the BMI will calculate if it's over 40, you ought to be writing your e-source template so an alert gets triggered saying, hey, this, this patient's ineligible. You need to screen fail them. Or um, vitals. Um, some protocols require two vitals and take the average, and if it's above this, do a third one, right? Fairly complicated. Our system ought to automate that whole thing to make it brain dead. So anybody who's GCP trained can take the tablet, walk into a room, and basically have no protocol deviations because mm -hmm. they just instructions. 
And this can lend itself well to remote monitoring. Yes. Right? Exactly, yeah. Because the, the only theory... reason monitors are coming to the site is to do SDV, maybe right. to do some staff training, and then maybe to do drug IP reconciliation. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's SDV and then looking at some of the things that are in source that aren't in the EDC, but all of this is now doable now, particularly if the site you know, uploads the labs and everything. Mm -hmm. So CRO could say from the beginning, hey, sites have to agree to use this. Sites have to agree to upload the hard copy documents. We can do monitoring within 24 to 48 hours of the visit being completed. We'll do it in real time. We'll send out the queries. There'll be a lot fewer queries. Mm -hmm. Data will be accurate. There's no SDV. All those good things are true. And then maybe we'll go out once or twice for training, relationship building, IP accountability. Uh, maybe we'll got more for the sites that are struggling. But at least we have you know, the ability to focus on the big picture and, um, and work on you know, performance or accounts. Does this have EICF? No, not now. That is something we're thinking about. That's a whole other ball game, right? Yes. What are the challenges with that? Because it seems simple. Um, it, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, you need to build it, I think, for the IRB guidelines. So I think we're going to need to understand that whole part. Um, but with e-consent, I think one of the challenges when you have an e-consent process right now, where you have a separate tablet is, is it's hard to keep track of re-consents. So as you know, if a patient consented at V1 and a new consent form comes out, well, if I have a tablet, okay, I know I'm going to have a clean consent because it's not going to let me miss a signature and date. I, that that part of it is fine. But if I don't remember which patient I need to reconsent, that tablet's still sitting there, right? What's my forcing mechanism to mm. make sure I consent them before I do the procedure? Yeah. So we were thinking with our tool, if we had e-consent, that could be folded right into the workflow. So yeah. if a new version comes out, I open up the visit. Well, guess what? First thing I see is I need consent a reconsent um, procedure with the ICF right there in front of me. So I can't miss it. And I don't have to keep track of reconsents in a manual fashion, which is how most sites do it now. Yeah, it'd be like something like getting an Amber Alert on your phone. You know, that's the first exactly. thing you'll see. So that's something that it, I think you can integrate. It's just going to take yeah. some time to do. Um, I said there's a lot of value props here. This is good. So uh, I guess... Do you want to talk price? We we can. I mean, we, we try to be about 1% or 2% of revenue for the site, um, depending on what features and modules they buy. So there's we have a recruiting module, we have a finance module. Um, really? Yeah. So yeah, what so do those do? Well, it, we have a traditional CTMS. We do all the traditional things the CTMS system does. Oh, so you have a, you have a CTMS system also. Yes. Yeah. Which you can use either on a standalone basis. You can use just the e-source. You can use e-source with CTMS or just the CTMS only. Um, but what the CTMS really is, is if you look at both systems, it's really scheduling, recruiting, and finance. Um, now, with our system, it's all integrated. So finance is integrated directly to e-source. So to give you an example, if I'm a coordinator and I complete the urine pregnancy test, well, in my finance module, I get to invoice 30 bucks for it, right? So I don't have to go into another system or an Excel spreadsheet to say, hey, UPT done for subject six. The system knows that, and it generates the receivable automatically. And we can also embed financial implications at the question level. So let's just say the urine pregnancy test was out of range or whatever, and I have to repeat it, right? Repeat tests, you can get good you can get compensated for that, but you have to keep track of them. It's very hard to keep track of because that's the last thing the coordinator is on their mind is to go update the CTMS. Right. Well, our system, right, you can have a question, hey, this was out of range. You have to repeat. Did you do a repeat test? And if you answer yes on the drop-down list, that yes answer mm -hmm. will trick the receivable. And so now at the end of the visit, the site management now has accurate financials. So unlike a traditional CTMS, or I would call them a more outdated CTMS that does not use eSource, uh, right. you have to go manually and put all these things right. in there. So it's the same thing yeah. as doing it on an Excel sheet. It, very close, very similar, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. same time. And, yeah, and, and you know, coordinators are busy. That's the last thing on their mind, right? So, so the coordinators have to spend time doing this, 
And then usually somebody has to go chase the coordinates down. Yeah. And say, hey, did you do this? Um, or I got this check and I got paid for this. You know, did you actually do it then? Right. Um, and so a lot of sites are leaving money on the table also because if I'm a coordinate and I don't check off that they did the repeat EKG, how, yeah. how, you know, how am I going to know to invoice them? Right. So a when good amount ran... of money left on the table. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to leave the money on the table. When you ran a, your site, did you use a CTMS? I did. You did. And what were your experiences? I was always chasing the coordinators, and at some point I think I just abandoned it. And uh, <laughs> See, that's why the... we don't use it at our sites, too. It's because we ask ourselves a simple question. Can this be better? Can, can Excel do this just as good? Right. Right? right. <laughs> but with your product, and I'm not just saying this because you're on, but you have the source that integrates into it. Right. So now you could say, well, no, Excel can't do this better, right? But with a traditional CTMS, it's hard to argue that. Right, right. And I actually, when I was running a site on the contracts, I didn't even ask for repeat procedure. <laughs> yeah, I've done that to too. Because the time for me to get it right is probably about the dollar value of what I'm going to run <laughs> from that. So I just didn't bother. So I had very simple contracts. And now looking back, if I had the system, I could have gotten everything I asked for. And I'd be able to invoice for everything. Make about ten to 15000 per study more, right? Yeah, I, I think it's easily. It's it, it, We always tell people it's more than the 1% or 2% that we're asking you to pay for our system. Mm -hmm. That's just in the reimbursement. And then you get all the time value on top of that. Yeah, I think so. 1%. Yeah, it'd be much more than that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you have a million dollar site, one percent is ten thousand. Are you leaving ten to fifteen grand on the table? Easy, easily, right? Yeah, easily. I think you, they're leaving that with a hundred fifty thousand dollar a year study. I've heard horror stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Now, as far as recruitment, how does this help recruitment? Um, so you can use it for as a single patient database, and you can use it to screen patients against studies, like a CTMS. One thing that we built is we built this concept of a patient database with a living history. So on most CTMS, there's a medical history and there's medications. And you have that in your patient recruiting database. So next time you do a search, you can actually filter for those patients and you can decide who to call for a campaign or for a study. So in our system, medical history and medications, guess what? That's also being collected at visit one for most studies. So our recruiting and our e-source talk to each other. So if I took the time to pre-screen on the phone, I wrote down three medications and three medical indications. At V1, when I open up my source, I'll see those three indications listed and those three medications listed. They're not published. They're not part of source yet. I have to actually do something. I have to hit the publish button, essentially. So I can make changes and modifications and confirm that. And when I make modifications in source, it goes back into the recruiting database and updates it. So at the end of the study, I have accurate and up-to-date medications and medical history hmm. and when i was running a site that drove me crazy because patients were never fully accurate the first time they told you on the phone by the time they were done with the study i had a you know very good information about them but unless i paid somebody to go in at the end of the study and upload it i lost that accurate information so the next time i ran a search i was probably leaving people off who i should have picked up or i was including people that were false positives that never actually had the condition they said it so I'm wasting, you know, calling efforts against that person. Um, so either way, I really wasn't building my patient database in an accurate manner that allowed me to, to fully leverage those patients that, you know, do want to repeat um, study, you know, performance. Um, so that's like the concept. Thing. Yeah. And it, you're relatively new startup. So what? It's very interesting that you decided to go after the sites. Why not go after the CROs? Yeah, I. So that was a very deliberate strategy on our part. The way I see it is, is that for eSource to work, it has to be a site tool. It has to be workflow friendly for the research sites because they're the people using it. And um, we do see our eSource system as something that adds a lot of value to sponsored CROs that we absolutely do want to make it an offering for, um, for them to embrace. But we wanted to actually prove that sites will use it, sites will get value out of it, because when sites get value out of it, all that value goes upstream to the sponsors, right? Sites that perform well, that have better data, that are more productive, that are more engaged, that have higher morale, that do all things. That's great for the sponsor, right? If I'm a sponsor, I want sites mm -hmm. doing that. Um, 
And since we actually offer this, we have over 100 sites that have signed up to use our system. So I think we, you know, it wasn't just me who wanted this technology. I've talked yeah. to a lot of partners that said, you know, I've been thinking about exactly this technology. And how, have, how have you been selling it? Conferences? Conferences and a lot of cold calls and emails. Um, but we've been able to find, you know, several thousand sites, which you can. I mean, there's, there's public information mm -hmm. out there. It's, you know, not hard to find if you just put the labor into it. Yeah. So we put a, a lot of attention into building out the database. And we knew that the first year we sold it, like you said, you know, 90% plus say no. And it's about, about right. And some percentage will say yes, but a small percentage of a large number is a large number. So that's yeah. how we got 100 sites pretty quickly within a year. And, and a growing just, number because the as more, it's yes. like proof of concept, right? Social proof. Yes. The more yes. they see their colleagues using it and the more they talk about it at the next, it's like Bitcoin, you know? Yes. The more people exactly. start talking and pretty soon now everyone's talking about it, right? Same, right. same thing here. I think you're just early. Um, very good. So people can go to clinicalresearch.io. Anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, that's that's about it. I think I think you covered everything. I think it's good. I got to learn a lot more about it. Um, I think it's an interesting product. I think there is value. And uh, good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for... Oh, can people find you on LinkedIn? Uh, they can just look me up, Raymond Namizu, N O M I Z U. Oh, and uh, it's Clinical Research I O. And uh, our company is also pronounced Creo, C R I O. So you can probably do a search for the company name as well. Clinical Research I O. Very good. I'll put the links underneath. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Thank you, Raymond. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye bye. Thank you.